So this class um, of vertebrates called amphibia, which we know as amphibians, is uh, the topic of this section. And the learning outcomes are to describe the characteristics and the major groups of amphibia, and to explain the challenges of moving from an aquatic to a terrestrial environment. So these were the first vertebrates, or at least uh, their ancestors were the first ones to come onto land. So here we are, we just finished with the fishes, and here are the lungfish right here, the dipnoe, uh, and here are the amphibians right here. And uh, we move now from uh, aquatic vertebrates uh, to terrestrial uh, vertebrates. So. Um, amphibians are going to be direct descendants from fishes, and we'll see some transitional fossils that show uh, some linking there. They include frogs, salamanders, and cassilians, which are an odd snake-like amphibian without limbs. These are the first vertebrates to walk on land, and amphibians today play very, uh, very important roles in terrestrial food chains. They eat things, and they get eaten as well. There's five distinguishing features. Uh, for amphibians, first of all, they now have limbs or legs. Uh, so now we're looking at a group of vertebrates that we might call tetrapods, which means four legs. They have lungs, which is important when you move on to land so that you can uh, exchange uh, uh, atmospheric gas, uh, respiratory gas is the atmosphere. Uh, and amphibians also have a lot of blood vessels in their skin, it's called, uh, and they're capable of cutaneous respiration, which helps supplement their lungs. Their, their lungs are still uh, somewhat primitive and uh, respiratory system compared to others, so they do need to supplement with that. Uh, and then they have pulmonary veins. Uh, and this here, we're going to see now two circuits. Uh, and with fish, we only saw one circuit. It was uh, from the heart to the gills to the body back to the heart, just all one loop. Here, you're going to have two circuits. You're going to have blood being sent to the lungs to get oxygen. And you're going to be another circuit sending oxygenated blood to the body to deliver that oxygen there. So there's two circuits. The one going to the lungs is called the pulmonary circuit. Uh, and the amphibians are going to have a partially divided heart. Uh, fish, they only had uh, two chambers, and now we're going to move to a three-chambered heart. And then eventually four-chambered heart when we get to uh, some reptiles, birds, and then mammals. Uh, so... Um, we had to overcome some challenges moving on uh, onto land uh, if you're a fish. First of all, you're going to need legs to support the weight. You're going to need lungs so that you can get oxygen from the air. And then you're going to need a redesigned heart uh, that um, is going to be having uh, necessary for driving uh, larger muscles for moving on land. Uh, for the amphibians, reproduction still required water. Uh, and that's to prevent the egg from drying out. So it seems that animals were having the same problems that we saw with the plants. Uh, until the seed evolved, the plants were still tied uh, mostly to water. So there's the parallels there. Uh, and then they need assistance to prevent whole body desiccation or drying up. And so here we see a uh, drawing of a fossil that was given the name Ichthyostega. And even in the name, ichthyo means fish. However, these this is one of the first amphibians. Uh, and that fossil, or amphibians, uh, probably evolved from common ancestor with lobe fin fish. The sarcopterygii we were talking about earlier, like the coelacanth and the, uh, the lung fishes, probably share common ancestry with amphibians. And ichthyostega is the genus for this uh, particular fossil, which was found in rocks 370 million years ago, which gives us sort of the set point date uh, to start thinking about when were some of the first uh, terrestrial vertebrates uh, appearing. It was around that time, and millions of years is a long time. When it comes to Ichthyostega, uh, they have some um, uh, features on there. They have flipper-shaped limbs, uh, roughly, and so they probably moved around more like a seal or a sea lion. Uh, and then they had broad overlapping ribs uh, to form this more like a solid uh, type of rib cage to help protect vital organs like the lung and the heart. In about 2005 or 6, I remember reading reports back in 05, I think, they were looking for fossils that uh, would show some sort of transition between fish and uh, some of the first amphibians. And so 
they have some set points there, like Ichthyostega found 370 million years ago. And then some of the lobe fin fish that were in the fossils, we say we go back 385 years or so. And so we're thinking if you have these fish here and these amphibians and we think they share common ancestry, then there should be some sort of uh, uh, transitional fossil that shows somewhere between fish and amphibian in, in rocks that date to ages somewhere between those, those uh, uh, millions of years. And they were aware of a, a rock outcrop in northern Canada that fit that age. So they went and uh, over several seasons, they were looking for fossils. They found many fossils. Uh, and in one of the last seasons that they were there, they found this fossil here that they called Tiktaalik. Uh, and it's something between a fish and uh, an amphibian. You can see the face is flattened here. You got eyes facing upwards like an amphibian. Uh, you're going to have some bones uh, for these fins here, and then toward the back end, it looks uh, a lot more fish-like. Uh, so what we had here was a transitional fossil between a lobe fin fish like the coelacanth, which already has bones in those uh, uh, fleshy fins, and then the bones that they found, in, uh, and they found more than one fossil. There were several fossils here. Uh, the bones were tiktaalik, even more uh, like uh, four limbs in a tetrapod. Uh, and so for comparison here, we can look at uh, the lobe fish that were up here, coelacanth. We already saw this one here. And then we look at uh, tiktaalik, and these are the bones here. This is the, the pectoral girdle bones. And you can see that pink bone is like our funny bone, our humerus. Then you have your radius and your own, and then some other bones there. And then this is the early amphibian uh, forelimb and hind limb. And so the bones are there for walking on land already. How much time Tiktaalik has been on land, we wouldn't know, but uh, still had a lot of features that tied it to water. Uh, so when it comes to amphibians, um, there's quite a bit of a history there. There was a, a time in which amphibians dominated the terrestrial environment. Uh, and uh, so uh, when we go back to the Carboniferous period, about 360 to 280 million years ago, uh, amphibians became common. There was 14 identified families based on the fossils. So there was enough differences in these amphibians uh, to uh, identify 14 families. Then late in that period in the Carboniferous, uh, much of North America was a tropical swamp. Remember the the tectonic plate tectonics, these continents move around. And so while North America is more uh, toward northern latter, uh, latitudes during this time where North America, it was at the time, uh, was more tropics around the equator. And at that time, 34 families uh, were seen. Then we come to the Permian, which is after the Carboniferous. Uh, and some amphibians are even adapting to uh, the dry uplands. And upland is moving away from uh, where you have water, like in ponds and so on. By the mid-Permian, uh, this would be a uh, term the age of the amphibians, 40 families, quite a bit of diversity there. And 60% of them show evidence of being fully terrestrial. Uh, now, I'm not sure the specifics there on how they would go about uh, doing their reproduction because uh, the amphibians we know today still require water because they didn't have an amniotic membrane in the egg. By the end of the Permian, we have that mass extinction. The Permian extinction was a very massive extinction there. Reptiles had already started to evolve from amphibians, early reptiles, and uh, the rhapsid reptiles, which we're going to talk about in the next section here, became common and outcompeted the amphibians. So uh, after that mass extinction of the Permian, uh, the rhapsids began to dominate the land. Uh, they were better adapted for that uh, life on land. And the aquatic and amphibians were pushed back uh, to the water, being closer to water. So these are uh, what's left of those amphibians from uh, that history there. These There's uh, three orders. So the class is amphibia, right? So the kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, uh, and then we have the, the classes amphibia, and then these are orders. Frogs and toads belong to the order Anura. There's about 6,500 species. Caudata, caudal means toward the end, and these guys I remember because they keep their tail. They look lizard-like. Those are the salamanders and newts. 
And then the apoda, which means without feet, the Cassilians. So we have a group that are much like snakes, who share ancestry with lizards, and snakes lose their limbs to become fossorial. And fossorial means uh, to live underground, like a fossil. And so they have a fossorial habit, uh, and they live underwater. These are tropical uh, tropical species, about 200 species. They're pretty odd looking. And you can see a picture of a Cassilian here on the right uh, the, uh, of the order Apoda. Here is a tiger salamander uh, in the order Caudata. And then uh, the red-eyed tree frog here, very uh, popular uh, for posters and pictures and stuff. About 7,000 species. Um, uh, are identified today uh, and uh, in those orders that were mentioned. So when it comes to the anura, the order anura, these are frogs and toads. Uh, they have smooth, moist skin, if we call it a frog. Uh, it's going to have pretty long legs, uh, which are really good for pushing them through the water and swimming. Most are going to live near water, and uh, they go through a larval a tadpole stage, which then goes through a metamorphosis, forming little froglets that then grow and then become sexually mature. Uh, and then we have our their drier skinned uh, uh, relatives called the toads. They tend to have drier skin. They're going to have more keratin in their skin, which helps prevent uh, prevent even more uh, uh, or helps reduce water loss across the skin. Their legs are going to be shorter. We have many toad species around here. They live in drier environments, but they still need to go back to water to uh, reproduce. And to be called a toad does not mean you're related. There's many different species of toads that became toad-like independent of each other. So this to call it a toad is not a monophyletic group. They, the toads uh, don't share common ancestry. Uh, and that's something we've discussed before about uh, being monophyletic or polyphyletic. Uh, so the egg laying has to go into water because they like those air, uh, uh, watertight membranes that we see in the amniotic membrane. It hasn't evolved uh, in this, it never evolved in this group. Uh, fertilization is ex external in the water, and we know the tadpole and then gradual metamorphosis to adult. The order caudata is the salamanders. They're going to have long bodies, tails. Uh, skin is still smooth and moist. The eggs are uh, going to be fertilized internally. This is interesting. Uh, they, they, they're still in the water here, but what happens here is that the male will leave a packet of sperm uh, behind, and then the female comes and places her cloaca uh, right over there. And a cloaca is just a common opening where the digestive system, the urinary system, and the reproductive system all empty into the same uh, cavity uh, with one opening called the cloaca. So the female comes with her cloaca and picks up the, the sperm packet. So that's how they uh, basically affect internal fertilization. And then the apoda, they're tropical and burrowing amphibians and uh, no legs, uh, very small eyes. They don't need eyes if they're underground often. Uh, they have a jaw with teeth and fertilization is also internal uh, by the same kind of means with uh, sperm packets. This section covers the class Reptilia and your learning outcomes for this section are to describe the characteristics and major groups of the, rep of the reptiles and then to distinguish between synapsids and diapsids, and then explain the significance of the evolution of the amniotic egg. This was a key. It's like the seed in the plant world. In the animal world, it was the amniotic egg that allowed us, uh, them to move on to land. So we come over here. We just finished with, um, in the cladogram here, um, we just finished with the amphibia. Uh, here are the mammals, which we won't cover until uh, after birds. And so we have a common ancestry here, and then here we have some major groups of living reptiles. There's other groups that have gone extinct. And there you can see birds out here, which we covered next, which share a common ancestor with crocodiles. Crocodiles are actually more closely related to birds, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, now, reptiles seem to have mastered uh, all of the characteristics that we would need to evolve for a terrestrial lifestyle. Today, there are 10,000 identified species. And it's, uh, it's interesting that the prior textbook, if you have the 11th edition, uh, they use the word reptiles and then in some cases the amniotes. And uh, this is because when we go back to these early amniotes that developed the amniotic egg, 
uh, and we call them all reptiles, well, some of those gave rise to mammals uh, later on. So uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons why the authors of the book changed it to amniotes. And sometimes they refer to this group that in, uh, does not include the, the amphibians. If we include the amphibians and all the birds and everything, we can call those uh, tetrapods. But if we just include, we leave out the amphibians and uh, go all the way to the birds there on this cladogram, then this is the, the amniotes or the amniota. So a key feature here is the amniotic egg. And here, this is something the frog egg is missing. They're missing this membrane that allows or prevents uh, water from evaporating. Uh, and so that prevents the embryo from drying out. They're going to have more keratin in their skin, so that means drier skin, which helps prevent and retard water loss further. And they're going to do something that amphibians couldn't do, which is a negative pressure breathing. They're going to do thoracic uh, breathing where they expand uh, the thoracic cage, and that reduces pressure when you increase volume, and that takes air in. That's more efficient than amphibians. Have you ever seen a frog? They're at the bottom under their under their mouth in their what we would call our chin area. You can see the the muscles that are being used. They take air into their mouth and then they have to push it in with a positive pressure to get into their lungs. That's not efficient. So here was the key here, the evolution of this egg. Uh, and this egg is actually uh, the amniotic membrane is seen in all the other vertebrate groups, reptiles, birds, and mammals even. And there's even mammals that lay eggs like the duckbill platypus. Uh, those that don't still have the amniotic membrane. So the amniotic membrane is still part of the placenta uh, in humans and um, uh, other mammals. So there are some key membranes that are within there. So here you have your uh, your egg uh, with birds, a heart shell, some of the, uh, like crocodiles, when they lay their eggs, it's more leathery. Uh, but you can see here, here's the amnion, and the amnion surrounds directly the embryo that's in there. And within that membrane is the amniotic fluid. Uh, you're going to have some other uh, membranes as well, the yolk, uh, the membrane that surrounds the yolk sac. You're going to have the chorion, which becomes important when we have a placenta in mammals. Uh, so the chorion is out here, and that's going to help with gas exchange. It's the outermost uh, membrane, so you to get, take oxygen in and get out carbon dioxide. And you're going to have the elantois out here. Uh, and the elantois here in uh, this uh, egg here serves as a place where waste uh, products can be eliminated. Here is a table of major orders of the reptilia. Uh, it's the class reptilia. Uh, the subphylum is still vertebrata. Uh, like all the tables we've been seeing, it has the approximate number of species that have been identified. You can see there's one group here where there's one only one species alive today. It was a much larger group, uh, but... Uh, all the others have gone extinct. They're commonly called tuatars. They look like lizards, but they're not. And uh, the order is called Rhynchocephalia. Uh, you probably heard of turtles and tortoises. They belong to the order Chelonia. Uh, and then the squamates. Uh, these two share very, very close, uh, or more recent common ancestor of the other groups. Uh, and it's just a picture of snake, uh, uh, ancestors of snakes lose their limbs. Some snakes today still have remnants. They still have parts of the pelvis, uh, and even the femur bone, they include boas and, um, pythons. When you look at their skeleton, they still have these structures that show they had legs at one time. So that's pretty cool. So the lizards belong to the order called Saria and snake serpentis, or an older name would be Ophidia. And then there's the crocodilia, which includes crocodiles, alligators, and some others um, that are there, about 25 species only. And then the rest, of here, these are extinct lines here, uh, and they all went extinct. Uh, the, 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 the dinosaurs, they when they disappeared. So one of my favorites when I was a kid is Stegosaurus, uh, and there's an order that they belong to. Uh, this one's going to be important. That uh, This is a Tyrannosaurus, a T-Rex. Uh, they belong to an order called Cerichia. Uh, and this is going to be a group that uh, well, that uh, has uh, descendants that include birds. Uh, then we have the, uh, the pterosauria, like those pterodactyls, and then the plesiosaurs with the real long necks and aquatic. And then this is interesting here because you had some reptiles. Reptiles, uh, amphibians came onto land and reptiles evolved on land. And then some reptiles went back into the water just like whales uh, from uh, mammals that had uh, limbs and you see here 
uh, convergent evolution with that fusiform shape and these fin-like, uh, flipper-like structures for the fish that move through the water. So uh, reptiles, uh, when they evolved, uh, they dominated for 250 million years. The age of the dinosaurs is the Mesozoic era, which was a, a quiz question I gave early on. Uh, and so during that time, the Mesozoic includes the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. At the end of the Cretaceous, the dinosaurs uh, vanish. So uh, when it comes to these early groups of, um, of amniotes or reptiles, if you prefer, uh, they actually can be distinguished uh, during that time based on the number of uh, extra holes they had in their skull. An anapsid had zero holes. So this is an anapsid. And today... We have one group of an at anapsids still alive today, which is the turtles and the, the tortoises uh, still alive today. And then we have uh, the synapsids. And the synapsids have one extra hole there. And this is besides the cavity where your eyes go. That's called the orbit. So uh, the turtles, tortoises have an orbit still, but they don't have that extra opening here. And then you have the diapsids. And there they have two openings uh, here. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at these. And, and look, this is the caption that the old book had. It said reptile there. And the new book, the 12th edition, they replaced that with amnio. But the caption then still talks about reptiles. So that's interesting there. So we're going to start with the synapses. And recall here the synapses have one opening there. Okay. Uh, and the, the anapses are not going to be covered very much in this section. But they're the, today only one group is the the, the Chelonia is still alive. Other groups... Uh, of anapsids went extinct. So looking at the synapsids, one of the first groups of synapsids uh, that had that one extra opening in the skull were called pelicosaurs. Uh, so these were the early synapsids, and they dominated for about 50 million years uh, when the reptiles were becoming dominant. And so these were the first uh, vertebrates that were really large, uh, had real nice teeth, and could take down and kill other uh, animals uh, that were just about their size. This one's about four meters long, uh, and each meter is just over three feet, so we're talking that uh, over 12 feet long in length. Uh, and so those pelicosaurs were replaced. Now, when we say replaced, you have to interpret that not necessarily as the pelicosaurs wiped out all of a sudden, uh, just that other reptiles were around and evolving at the time, and then perhaps because the ones, these ones that were evolving had better adaptations, they're able to take advantage of the environment better, and so they become more dominant, as seen in the fossil record. You see more diversity of this group than you do of the pelicosaurs. So uh, they replaced the pelicosaurs about 250 million years ago. And so if we go back to that other slide where these guys dominated for 50 million years, so 250 million years ago, the, the rapses are coming on the scene, okay? 50 million years prior to that, the pelicosaurs were dominant. So we're talking about a total of 350 million years ago for uh, the pelicosaurs there. Okay, so at least the rapses are pretty interesting because they may have been endotherms. Today's reptiles are ectotherms. Uh, some people misname them and say they're cold-blooded, but they're not. They're the temperature of their surrounding. That's ectotherm. Some of them were even mammal-like. Uh, so they were mammal-like reptiles. So most of the therapsids became extinct about 170 million years ago. So 250 million years ago, the therapsids become uh, uh, dominant on the landscape and then uh, you go to 170 million years ago and most of them became extinct. And what were they replaced by? Another group of reptiles called the diapsids. The diapsids had the two holes in the skull, right? There's one survived uh, group from there that descended from these therapsids. Most of them became extinct 170 million years ago. And the one group that survived all of that is the group that gave rise to the mammals. So the mammals evolved from therapsid uh, uh, which were uh, synapsids with one hole in their skull, one extra hole. So now looking at the diapsids, these are going to be the ones that had those two extra holes in within their skull. The diapsids include a group of, of uh, reptiles called the archosaurs, and SAR translates to lizard, roughly. So 
They do have the diapsis skull with the two pairs of holes on each side. Um, and there was a number of different diapses that occurred. Uh, I remember we're talking about the age of the of the um, of the reptiles. Uh, so that includes the Mesozoic era, which includes Triassic period, Jurassic period, and then the Cretaceous. So here, there was a number of different diapses in the Triassic period, which is from 248 to 213 million years ago. Remember in an earlier uh, le uh, lecture on the same chapter, I talked about perhaps tracking all of this with a timeline that you're drawing and you fill in uh, as you actively engage this material. And when you do, you end up with a bunch of bars and you see all this overlap of these different groups. Uh, and I think I put... Uh, an example up there. I think I have also on the study questions for this chapter, I have a sample of what I started and then suggested that if you uh, try to continue filling in that timeline as you work your way through this uh, chapter here. Now, here's the interesting thing about the archosaurs. Okay? The archosaurs are diapsids, and there were several groups of diapsids that, he bought, that evolved at the time. What do they have in common? The two whole extra holes on each side of the scope, right? So if we look at one group of those archosaurs, they're significant because that one group gave rise to crocodiles that we have today, the pterosaurs like the pterodactyls, the dinosaurs, so the dinosaurs evolved from these archosaurs, and modern birds that we see today. Okay. So mammals from the therapsids, which were synapsids, right? And the diapsids gave rise to the dinosaurs, big thing to remember there, Crocodiles and birds that we see today. Uh, some of these, uh, the archosaurs, this group here, uh, they were bipedal. They walked on two legs, much like you see in the image right up here. Uh, one of the archosaurs, uh, one of the archosaur groups rose to dominance, and we refer to those as the dinosaurs. Okay, so, found a nice little diagram here to track some of that phylogeny here. Here's that polycosaur we saw earlier, and uh, there's times down here. Uh, here's uh, a therapsid right here, and then your mammals, which are still alive today. Now, early on, before uh, those archosaurs evolved and give rise to dinosaurs and birds and crocodiles, and send, here's your tuatar and your lizards and your snakes, the anapsids broke off, the ones that didn't have extra hole in their head, right? So, uh, and then here, here's the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. This is the Mesozoic era. Okay. Uh, and so at these points here, we would interpret the same as a cladogram. At some point, a common ancestry there. Uh, so the dinosaurs evolved about 220 million years ago. So that would be right about there okay, on the timeline, which is right around when you're getting towards the Jurassic uh, time. And the dinosaurs are going to dominate from uh, starting at about 220 million years ago for 150 million years until when? If we subtract from here to here, we're going to get approximately 65 million years ago. Okay, so starting from here, going this way, 150 million years, boom, big asteroid comes in and could probably cause massive climate change and we uh, lost an entire group. Now, and if you think back over here, the ancestry of mammals was around at that time. Some of them were quite small mammal-like reptiles, if you will, uh, and they're still alive today, and they survived that crisis of that massive environmental uh, catastrophe that occurred. And uh, their descendants are the mammals we see today, represented by this one raccoon that you see there. Where's my mark? By this raccoon here. Uh, so... When we talk about these dinosaurs, the weight of their body was directly above their legs, which allows them to move more with more agility and speed. Some of them were very enormous and actually went back to four-legged. So you think about some of these uh, brachiosaurs. Uh, I used to, we used to call them brontosaurus when we were uh, kids. I think there's some uh, debate on what they should be named within the scientific community some, some time back. So they refer to them as brachiosaurs, brachiosaurs. The theropods, okay? this is a theropod dinosaurs. Uh, they're a group of dinosaurs within the dinosaurs. The theropods were some of the most uh, fearsome predators. Uh, and the theropods of the dinosaurs, which are diapsids, which evolved from archosaurs. 
those uh, the therapsids also gave rise to birds. So when we look right here, this would be one of those uh, therapsid type. Um, look, kind of looks like a T. Rex skeleton, but it's a different genus uh, there. So now looking at important characteristics for modern reptiles. Modern reptiles have some important characteristics. They have the amniotic me uh, membrane. We know that already, right? Um, and so we're looking at modern reptiles. What do we see here? They're on land. You can't just release your gametes into the water anymore. So fertilization has to be in, in, internal. And for this, in many cases, these reptiles develop an intromittent organ to help transfer the sperm uh, to the female. Okay, so the sperm fertilizes the egg before the protective membrane that, or shell uh, surrounds it. They also have an improved circulation here. We saw with the amphibians, we had two circuits. Here, the heart is going to become more efficient at separating blood going to the lungs and blood going to the body. Why do you want to send blood to the lungs? Because it's already been to the toes and the, the forelimbs and the brain and it's already delivered oxygen. So it's got to be brought back to the lungs. So it's got to come back to the heart first. Okay, so that's the systemic circuit going to the body. Um, once it goes to the body, it's got to come back to the heart again, and then from the heart be sent to the lungs. So we have two circuits, your systemic and your pulmonary circuit. So we know that the, the amphibians had three chambers and not as efficient a heart. So here, we're going to have further refinement. We go back to the fish. The fish only have one circuit. They have a two-chambered heart, one atrium and one ventricle with a muscle that pumps the blood to the gills to get oxygen, and then oxygenated blood is red. At the tissues there, in the capillaries, we deliver the oxygen, we come back, they color it blue because deoxygenated blood. So when you look at the amphibian heart here, they're going to have three chambers, uh, the same with most reptiles, with the exception of crocodiles. Okay. And what we have down here is a ventricle that has a partial division. There's still an opening right there that allows for a little bit of mixing. And anytime you mix oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, it's not good. Right, so uh, we send from here, we send blood to the lungs that's pulmonary, and that blood comes back nice and red and oxygenated. But once it gets into the ventricle, there's still an opening there. We get some mixing, so the blood that gets sent out to the body is we color it purple because it's not fully oxygenated, it got mixed a little here. Uh, so we see reptiles still have a three chambered heart, and the exception is a very close relative of birds, the crocodiles. The crocodiles are going to have a complete septum or a complete division right there, and you don't get any mixing. Birds also and mammals, we have a four-chambered heart. But if you think about snakes, uh, lizards, um, those have a three-chambered heart still. Okay. So um, when we look at uh, the living reptiles, they're all ectothermic. They, they obtain their heat from external sources. Uh, and if they're going to warm up, they have to do it behaviorally. So they will go out into the sun in the morning, warm up to a good uh, temperature that their muscles work efficiently for finding food and escaping predators. Uh, and that's different than what we see with mammals, which are endothermic. So we're endothermic, birds are endothermic. And here our body temperature comes from internal heat. And that's actually more energetically cost, costly to maintain a body temperature. So uh, looking at modern reptiles, their taxonomy, their classification, uh, we already saw some of that table there of the ones that are still alive today. They include the turtles and the tortoises, thus the chelonia, the rhynchocephalia, which has only one species that lives in, uh, I think, uh, in New Zealand or islands off of New Zealand, which is near Australia, the tuatara, the squamata, which include the lizards and snakes, and then the crocodilia, which includes crocodiles and alligators. About 10,000 species worldwide. And reptiles occur just about anywhere except the coldest regions because they are ectotherms. And if it gets too cold, they, they're not going to be able to warm up to be able to move around. So looking at the Chelonia, there's about 340 species uh, of uh, turtles and tortoises. And um, you can tell when one is aquatic, when you look at the, at the shell of the turtle, which actually bones... Uh, much like the bones that form in our skull, they form there as part of their skeleton uh, underneath their epidermis. Uh, here, you can tell the turtle that lives and swims in water because their their uh, shell is going to be streamlined like a fish or a shark or a whale. 
And then you can tell a tortoise because they're going to have a higher dome in the back. And then they're going to have legs that look more like elephant legs. Uh, and those of you drop them in water, they're going to drown. They are going to have, be heavy and sink like a rock. So uh, if you ever see a, tur uh, a turtle, quote unquote, that has a very high shell and these uh, legs that look like uh, elephant legs, don't go put them in the water and try and think you we were doing something nice and helping them return them back to the water. They're not turtles, right? So the top of the shell is called the carapace and the bottom is called the plastron. This is a term we've seen before with uh, crustaceans. Uh, so um, uh, the tortoises, are they're, they're terrestrial. Turtles are uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic. But to be called a tortoise is not monophyletic. That's the same with like the toads. The toads were... Uh, they came to be more terrestrial, not from a common ancestor, but through different lines of evolution. Uh, the turtles lack teeth, but have sharp beaks. Uh, and marine turtles, which are all endangered, by the way, with extinction, have to return back to land to lay their eggs. And then here's that tuatara, the order is Rhynchocephalia. Uh, very interesting, this uh, lizard, it looks very lizard-like, but it's not. Um, again, they get about a meter long. Uh, in length, uh, and again, the islands of New Zealand. One interesting thing they have is a parietal eye. They have an eye under their skin there on top of their head. Uh, and it's not like that it forms images, but rather senses day and, and uh, night cycles. Uh, and uh, that may help set their rhythms, their day and night rhythms. Um, they call it circadian rhythms. Uh, and then the squamates, or the order squamata, which includes uh, lizards and snakes. And you can tell there's between a lizard and the snake, because there are actually lizards today that don't have limbs. Uh, but lizards are going to have eyelids, and snakes do not. Most lizards are going to have a little opening for their ear as well. Uh, that's one way to tell them apart. So we do have a lizard that has lost its limbs that's um, got those features. Uh, so a characteristic uh, about the squamata is the presence of paired copulatory organs. These are the organs that transfer sperm, uh, and they're called one on each side of the cloaca. They have a cloaca common opening, and uh, from there, the uh, they're called a hemi, hemi, which means half, uh, penis, or hemipenis, plural. They have one on each side, and the one they use depends on how they line up with the female. For snakes, about 350 species, not all are venomous. Most snakes we have here are, are, are not venomous at all. Um, again, uh, they lack limbs, eyelids, and external ears. For lizards, they include iguanas, chameleons, geckos, annals, um, and uh, many have the ability to regenerate tails like geckos. Geckos can lose their tail and uh, grow it back. Uh, and skinks, which is another group of lizards. There's actually two venomous lizards, um, and they're the, the Gila monster and the, beard, the beaded lizard. These are very large lizards, and they're yellow and black in color. There's evidence to suggest that other lizards actually have some slight, uh, some proteins in there that are venom-like within their saliva, uh, making them uh, slightly venomous. And then the crocodilia. Uh, these are about 25 species. Uh, they're all primarily aquatic and carnivores. They include uh, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and gavials. Uh, this right here is, a, I think it's a gavial. They have a very, very thin uh, uh, mouth. They're, they're specialized for catching fish. They just lay in the water there and wait for a fish to swim into their where their mouth is, and boom, they uh, close shut on there. And then crocodiles, though, can be very enormous, uh, very large predators. You've probably seen documentaries where they wait for wildebeest to come to drink water and boom, they grab them there. Uh, they're adapted for hunting uh, whip by stealth with water. They have their eyes up on top of their head there and they're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And if something comes near, boom, they go out and attack. Uh, then alligators, only two species. There is the American alligator and there's one in China. Uh, so... Pretty interesting group, and this is the group that is most closely, they're more closely related to birds than they are to other reptiles. Now, this is another interesting thing is that behavior wise, uh, crocodiles resemble birds a lot more than they do other reptiles as well. Uh, the crocodilians, alligators, they build a nest and they guard it, they brood their young. That means they take care of, they have parental care for their young, just like birds do. 
They have a four-chambered heart, just like birds do. And speaking of birds, this is a bird that uh, has a habit of getting, going into a, a crocodile's mouth and, and picking out uh, chunks of food and parasites and stuff. And uh, the crocodile allows that to occur. It's a sort of a symbiotic uh, relationship there. So now we're going to look at vertebrates called birds, and they belong to a class Abies. And it was discussed earlier that this is a traditional classification and really the birds are actually part of uh, the reptile group. So that makes the reptiles paraphyletic if you don't include the birds in there. So we're gonna follow that traditional classification here and your learning outcomes are to name key uh, characteristics of birds and explain why some consider birds to be uh, one type of reptile. Now birds are the most diverse of all uh, terrestrial vertebrates. 10,000 species. We've been seeing uh, tens of thousands of species uh, with reptiles and now birds. And the success for birds lies in the evolution of the feather. So here we are here. We just finished covering uh, the reptilia here. But you can see that on this cladogram, uh, this hypothesis for the evolutionary relationship, relationship suggests that crocodiles and birds are share a more recent common ancestor than crocodiles does with other reptiles. So uh, there are many orders of birds. The most abundant with uh, 5,300 species are the perching birds. They're called, uh, the order is Passeriformes. So kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, uh, the class Abies, and this is order uh, Passeriformes. And so uh, they're called perching birds because their feet are well adapted for uh, perching and then the hummingbirds apodiformes, which means like translated would be uh, the form of without legs or feet. Uh, they're real tiny. They have real tiny feet there, and uh, the, the picciformes, the woodpeckers belong there, and uh, the pigeons and doves, columbiformes, about 310 species there. Uh, and here's one of my favorites, the raptors, the falconiformes, um, and then. Um, chickens belong to the galliformes, so they're called galliform birds, and then the ducks and seriformes, then some other groups like the ostrich group, kiwi and penguins and so on. So I, on the study questions, I have a question that asks you to look at the table for a few of these things and just to look at it and see some of the, some of the variation, not all of them. Uh, and you're not expected to memorize details for uh, these orders, so don't waste your time. Glance over it have an awareness and move on. You need to know the basic characteristics of birds is the most important one uh, here. So what are key features for birds? Well, they evolve feathers, that's something new. And those feathers are made of the same material as scales on a lizard or a snake, same protein as your hair uh, that you have, it's made of keratin. Uh, so they have feathers and they have a lightweight skeleton. So uh, birds still have the reptilian traits, amniotic eggs, they lay uh, they still have scales. If you go and you look at the legs of a chicken or a pigeon, there's still scales on their legs. But what are the things that distinguish them from the reptiles, if we compare, uh, is that they have modified scales called feathers, still made of that protein keratin. Uh, and the feathers are going to be used for flight, unless it's a flightless bird. The feathers also help conserve heat the way hair does for mammals. So they provide insulation in that. I look at the skeleton here to show you some, some key things here. This bone here, which is homologous to your breastbone, your, your sternum, has a very large keel or uh, uh, ridge there. And that's for these large, powerful breast uh, muscles, like our pectoral muscles on our chest, which are gonna be used to connect there to this humerus bone, same bone we have here, to pull down on that bone when they're flying. Uh, and their bones are hollow which makes them lighter, uh, which is an adaptation for flight. Uh, they're not 100% hollow, but they are a lot lighter and they're still relatively strong for their uh, weight uh, overall. So their skeleton is built for flight. I already mentioned that keeled uh, sternum there, breastbone there. Parts of the bones along the back uh, and the hip bone are going to be fused to help provide stability back here when they're in flight. Uh, so some fused bones for rigidity for a flight here. Uh, and those flight muscles are very, very powerful and make up about 30% of their body weight. And there's that keel of breast bone. Then the feather itself, this is a modified scale. 
Uh, it's made of the same protein as a scale. Uh, and these grow out of little pits in the skin called follicles, same as the way hair grows from our body, it grows out of follicles there. Uh, and if we were to zoom in uh, to the uh, feather itself, uh, the part that uh, here at the, where the feather uh, originally grew, uh, first started its development from, that's called the quill uh, there. And then you have the shaft that goes the rest of the way here. And then if you look at uh, the feather on either side, and this is an asymmetrical feather, which is a, a design that works well for flights. This is probably a flight feather found in the, in the wings there. Uh, and what they have sticking out of there are going to be barbs and then barbules, the little tiny ones. And those little barbules have these little hooks that allows to connect from one barb to the next one, making an overall uh, 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 structure that allow that can capture uh, air and allow air to flow over it smoothly the way it does over an airplane wing. <laughs> So looking uh, at a little bit of history for birds, uh, some of the oldest bird fossils or bird-like uh, fossils were uncovered in rocks about 150 million years ago. This one is a very, very famous, uh, that should be chapter 34, not 35. This one was named Archaeopteryx uh, and is one of the first known birds. And some of the feathers that are along the arms there do show that asymmetrical uh, one side or the other where the, the barbs are, suggesting that this animal here is capable of a little bit of flight uh, there. Uh, these, uh, these guys do share features with theropod dinosaurs. Remember the theropods are gonna be like Velociraptor, T-Rex, that, that group of dinosaurs. The skull, uh, they have a skull and they had teeth. That's very much reptile-like. Birds today just have a beak that uh, doesn't have teeth. They're going to have a tail, a long tail, that's more reptile-like there. Uh, and their forearms are nearly identical to theropods, so those uh, much shorter arms than uh, legs here. The feathers uh, in this group of animals uh, probably evolved first as insulation, and some hypotheses suggest perhaps uh, uh, for mating displays as well, the way some birds use today. Uh, and then from there, but just start going through changes and start finding other purposes uh, as evolution takes place. Uh, some other dinosaurs that are uh, on that share some ancestry with modern birds out here, and you can see this uh, falcon out here. Here's Archaeopteryx, uh, and there's a common ancestor between Archaeopteryx. Uh, Velociraptor, we know that from Jurassic World, and then uh, here's another. Uh, um, um, theropod uh, that shows some, some ancestry uh, over here and uh, this one was more of a recent find here, Caudipteryx uh, and uh, this one there's some variation. Uh, when you look at Velociraptor they had some kind of uh, scale feather type feature on them as well, not much like what you see on the, on the movies uh, and then uh, Caudipteryx over here had uh, symmetrical feathers. So those feathers were not going to be used for flight because in order to get flight, we know from modern birds that have symmetrical feathers, they can't be used for flight. Uh, and then Archaeopteryx has the asymmetrical feathers uh, overall. So here's a little phylogeny that's been put together, a proposed uh, hypothesis for their relationships, uh, evolutionary relationships for these fossils of these dinosaur groups that are thought to share very close ancestry with modern birds. So birds exhibit three evolutionary uh, uh, novelties, three new things that came about. One is the feathers, the other one is the hollow bones, uh, and then uh, other structural and uh, uh, physiological mechanisms that allow for flight. So they adapted uh, internally uh, metabolism, uh, certain structures with some of their internal organs that are going to help for flight. So we'll take a look at that. Now, you know, Archaeopteryx, you go back, I think the, the fossils found about 150 million years ago. It turns out that some other fossils that are definitely birds are found a little bit later. Uh, around 125, 120 million years ago. This is during the Cretaceous. Uh, and this is a genus called 
Confuciorinus, Confucior, Confuci, Confuciorinus is uh, probably how you pronounce that. And this is the fossil there on the right, and the rocks were dated to be around this time here. So this is uh, millions of years after Archaeopteryx, and their uh, long tail feathers, which may have been uh, to attract mates and so on, but overall uh, had all the features necessary for flight, including that keeled breastbone. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that um, the uh, these birds here, they were toothed, so they had teeth in there, uh, not like uh, modern birds here. And these birds then here, if we find them 120, 120, uh, 120, 125 million years ago, and then the dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago. So uh, that's uh, approximately 70 million years that these ancient birds are sharing the skies with flying dinosaurs, pterosaurs. So that's pretty cool. You have these two at the same time. So that's why I was building a timeline, trying to draw where's this and where's that. And you see, well, all of these things are, a lot's going on on the earth uh, in terms of evolution is uh, a good uh, take home message from there. So looking at modern birds, uh, they do share a lot of those characteristics. Not all modern birds can fly, but uh, many can. You can tell a lot about a bird by looking at their feet and their beaks. And it gives you an idea of what kind of habitats they might be in and what kind of food they might uh, be using. For example, owls, they have talons in their feet for uh, grabbing and killing their prey and a sharp beak for tearing. So you know they're predators. Ducks uh, have those uh, webbed feet for swimming uh, or uh, paddling along on the water. And their, their bills are flat or their beaks are flat. And that allows them to sift through the water and mud for invertebrates and, and vegetation to eat. And then finches, uh, this is the finch here. You can't really see it. Let's see, where's my mark? The finches tend to have a thicker bill, and that's a good adaptation for cracking seeds. Uh, and so um, that's pretty cool. So what are some adaptations that might be needed for flight? First of all, those muscles are going to require a lot of oxygen so they can generate ATP to power those muscles. So you're going to need an efficient res respiratory system. You're going to need efficient circulation. You don't want oxygenated and deoxygenated blood missing, so uh, mixing. So you've got a four-chambered heart now, unlike the other reptiles and the amphibians, right? So no mixing. And then you have endothermy, something we don't see in rep modern reptiles, right? Endothermy is like mammals. We keep our own body temperature. And in fact, birds tend to have a higher body temperature than we do. Ours is at 36. Uh, if, you feel, if you were able to feel the body of a living bird and you get under the feathers, under that insulation, you feel it, they're going to feel hot, like they're running a massive temperature. They're running a, a bit higher. Uh, and when you have a higher temperature, that means you're going to have a higher metabolic rate. So that's going to make for uh, powering those muscles. Going back to the respiratory uh, respir uh, respiratory system, mammals like us, uh, reptiles and uh, even amphibians, we're going to have that windpipe, the trachea. It goes down to the lungs okay? and the air goes in that one pipe and then back out. And so air goes and gets into the lungs and then comes back out. And it turns out when we breathe out, when we ex expir during an expiration, when we uh, take the air out, we don't take all of the air out of our lungs. There's still a, a certain volume of air in there. And so when you take the old air out, there's still old air in there. When you bring the new air in, it's going to mix with the old air. So that's not very efficient. So birds evolved a way to get around that. It's very interesting. They have air sacs. They have them in the posterior, which is the tail end, and then in the, in the front end, they have anterior air sacs. And these air sacs allow air to pass through the lungs in one direction only. So this is pretty cool. When the bird inspires or uh, it breathes in, uh, there's already going to be some air in the lungs that's delivering that oxygen. So the bird's breathing in, it takes the air down their trachea, and that air is going to go either directly to the lungs or to the posterior air sac. The air sacs are expanding. The anterior air sacs are also expanding and they're going to pick up the old air from the lungs and bring them up here. 
Now then, when the bird expires, it's going to push down on both of those sacs. That's going to force the air from the posterior sac out here through the lungs. And the air in the anterior sac can't go backwards because of valves, so it only can only go one way and comes out. And so what you have here is a one-way flow through the lungs. And so you don't get that mixing. So now we're going to look at our group, the class mammalia, or mammals. And our learning outcomes here are to describe the characteristics of mammals and to compare three groups of living mammals. There's about 5,000 species of mammals, and although after the dinosaurs uh, went extinct, and we get into the Cenozoic era, which is referred to the age of the mammals, uh, we still have uh, greater diversity in other vertebrate groups. Uh, so we have the lowest uh, number of species, and many of the mammals are not these large, charismatic, Africa, savannah uh, type uh, mammals like giraffes or elephants. Uh, about 4,000 of those species are small, rodents, bats, shrews, and moles. So here we are on the cladogram here. Here is the common ancestor to mammals and uh, reptiles and birds. Uh, and so we think back to the earlier chapter when the reptiles were evolving, right? There was that group uh, of synapsids uh, and uh, they gave rise to the therapsids and then that gave rise to the only living members of uh, that history. All the other ones went extinct. Mammals uh, came from that group. Uh, so looking at mammals, what is something that us mammals have that you don't see in the other vertebrate groups? Well, the obvious one most people would say first is hair. But the name mammal comes from something else, the mammary glands. So sometimes hair is not so obvious, especially on uh, some of those mammals that live in water, like a dolphin. They look like they're pretty smooth skin, uh, but they're still going to produce milk. So you can't find hair mammary glands is the other uh, big deal there. Uh, so just like scales on a reptile and feathers on a bird, Hair is made of keratin, and, and uh, hair, hair grows out of pits in the skin called follicles, just like the bird feathers grow out of there. And the purpose for hair is uh, it helps to insulate. It can camouflage, provide protection, uh, and also sensory as well. Uh, mammals like this porcupine here will have these uh, thick uh, hair structures, and then on the ends of the hairs within the skin are little receptors that can sense and feel. Um, the females are going to produce uh, and secrete milk in mammary glands. Milk is high calorie uh, to provide lots of energy for the infants. 50% uh, of that energy does come from fat, milk fat. Mammals also have endothermy, just like birds do, four-chambered heart. Uh, respiration is uh, from the, the negative pressure built by a diaphragm and other uh, muscles associated with the ribs. Uh, most mammals don't lay eggs anymore. Instead, uh, the, the embryo and the fetus develop inside, um, and the membranes um, that promote that are referred to as the placenta. And the placenta is, uh, involves the chorion and the lining of the, of the uterus where uh, the mother and the, the female uh, mammal and uh, the embryo or fetus exchange materials like oxygen and carbon dioxide. So um, the endothermy is going to allow for activity at any time of the day. So you can be nocturnal. You don't have to wait for the sun to come out to warm up like if you're a lizard. Uh, keep in mind, though, that en being endothermic like birds and, and mammals, that requires energy to sustain that body temperature and, and usually it has to be maintained in, in not all cases, but it has to be maintained within uh, a relatively narrow limit, um, unless you're a hibernator or you go into torpor like uh, some other mammals do, uh, which is they can lower their temperature much lower than uh, usual. For us, if we go hyperthermic, it's, it's game over. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, we also have uh, a diaphragm that provides a for efficient movement of air in and out. It's not a one-way flow through the lungs, but uh, that's the way it goes for us. And in the placenta for most mammals, and this is uh, showing a sagittal section through uh, a human mammal there. There's the 
the fetus developing still within there. Uh, and you still see a lot of the same membranes you see in the embryonic egg. This is the wall of the uterus. It's got it's very muscular. Uh, and before uh, the infant is born coming out of the birth canal, it's referred to in science as a uh, fetus and at the very early stages of embryo. So here the fetus is still fetal development. Uh, and you still have the same membranes you see in the egg. Look, there's the yolk sac. Okay, You've got the chorion. That's found in an egg. The chorion makes part of that uh, overall placental structure there. Uh, and the elantois is still present as well, uh, though they don't necessarily have the same function they do if it's an egg. Um, it's lay, uh, like an egg-laying species. So in this case here, the, not, the mammals are not born in an egg, usually, depends on the group. Uh, so they're live births. So sometimes we refer to that as a viviparous. Uh, overall. Uh, so mammals, uh, lines of mammals have several adaptations and uh, one of the things is differences in denti den uh, dentition. Dentition is the way the, the teeth are. Uh, and you can tell a carnivore when you see it because we're going to have sharp teeth uh, for ripping flesh. You can tell a herbivore because they're going to have teeth that have, uh, that are more flattened with some ridges for grinding plant material like an elephant here or a deer. Uh, you can see the beaver here with those real big uh, incisors there in the front for uh, ripping it um, uh, wood. Uh, and so uh, you can tell uh, overall. So, and here's your dog as a, as a member of uh, the carnivore group. And then humans have a sort of in-between uh, dentition for um, our, our, our omnivorous eating habits. For digestion, uh, many mammals are pretty good at extracting energy from plant material. Plants generally don't have as much energy as eating other animals, so if you're a predator, a carnivore. Uh, but animals like a cow uh, have developed a symbiotic relationship with microbes that live within their digestive system to help them break down uh, cellulose and other materials within the plant and extract more energy than you normally could if you didn't have that. Uh, cows and goats uh, are referred to as ruminant animals because they have a rumen or a multi-chambered stomach. So when the food first comes in there, it settles in this real large portion of the stomach, number three there, that's called the rumen. And in there is where all the microbes are, microscopic bacteria in there. There's going to be some fungi in there that all produce enzymes like cellulase that help break down cell walls of the plant and so on. And then they use the other chambers to further process the food after that. Uh, if you're not a ruminant mammal then, uh, and you're a horse, then you're going to have uh, a much bigger structure here at the end of the small intestine called the cecum. Uh, and in us humans, it's very reduced uh, and becomes part of the appendix, uh, perhaps because it started eating more meat uh, in our own evolution. Uh, so that's uh, adaptation for a uh, uh, herbivorous type of diet. Uh, and then there's hooves and horns. And the hooves are, are going to be these uh, uh, pads that are reinforced with keratin. Uh, and for these kind of animals, they're actually walking on their toes. So here is uh, a horse. Is the hoof is there on the toe. And what we would consider our heel is right back there. And so that's uh, pretty weird. So for all of these, they have hooved animals. And then there's horns there on that cow there. Uh, so horns are going to be found on sheep and cattle and antelope. And uh, this is going to be bone surrounded by keratin. And you don't, they don't lose these. Uh, and they're pretty strong structures. Antlers are found on deer. Uh, and they're just made up of bone with no keratin. They develop under their uh, skin. And the skin falls off. And then... Um, in most cases, those antlers are shared, shed annually and regrown. Uh, and then some uh, uh, one group can um, do powered flight, like the way birds can power their flight. This is not the flying squirrel or the sugar glider. They, those just have gliding ability. But these bats, which belong to an order uh, called Chiroptera, they're capable of powered flight and, and in terms of diversity they're second uh, to rodents. Rodents are the most diverse of the mammals. 
here, but this is very interesting is that um, they can do this part of flight and their wings are just uh, stretched out skin over what would be our fingers in our, in, in, in our limbs. So it's stretched out over four finger bones uh, and is even attached to the hind limbs. So you can see that these are the digits right here. And you can see that skin there and then even to the leg, there's the leg there and then even between the legs. Uh, and they're capable of using that to um, push through the air. They're also uh, known for their echolocation. They send out uh, sound. Uh, a lot of times that sound we can't hear. It's ultrasound. It's at a range we can't hear normally. And it bounces and echoes off objects. And they can uh, receive that with their two ears and then form an image in their head, just the way we receive light waves and form an image with our eyes. So that's pretty cool. So mammals diverged or diverged and then began to evolve about 220 million years ago. So the early mammals were around during the time of the dinosaurs, if we've been following a track in that timeline. Uh, but for these guys, they were pretty tiny uh, and kind of trying to stay out of the way of the dominant uh, terrestrial organisms at the time, which were the dinosaurs. So they were probably small rodent or shrew-like insects. Uh, active at night, so probably the ancestry of all mammals were nocturnal. Probably had very large eyes for seeing well at night. Um, the early mammals had a single lower jaw, uh, and there this, uh, if you track back to the ancestry, the therapsids had multiple bones in their jaws, so some of the bones from the jaw migrated to become part of the bones of the ear. There's three bones in the inner ear in mammals, and so this allowed uh, to amplify sound even more uh, compared to reptiles, so a more efficient ear uh, with that uh, modification of those structures. So we refer to the time after the dinosaurs went extinct as the age of the mammals, uh, and that's the Cenozoic, which comes after the Mesozoic, Meso of the middle, right? and then the Paleozoic is before then. And uh, the mammals, uh, as the dinosaurs disappeared, the mammals went through a radiation. And that just means they start evolving and forming new species and new groups. And so this uh, diversification occurred from 65 to, 200, to 2 million years ago. And a million years is a long time. Uh, mammals reached maximum diversity according to the fossil record 15 million years ago. Uh, and then since then, there's been a decline when you look at the fossils in, the, in terms of the types of species that, uh, that are seen up to date. So for our modern mammals, what we have today, there's uh, three, three big groups. Uh, and there were other mammals, but groups have gone and have become disappeared. There's the Protheria. And uh, the Therian is a reference to, uh, I think it's, a mythological monster or something like that, but it's also a reference to the placenta. So the Protheria is a kind of primitive placenta before placenta. These are the egg layers, okay? Uh, and so the Protheria included many groups of egg-laying mammals, and the only one surviving today is a group called the Monotremata, and we call them monotremes. And there's only three species alive today. And uh, their conservation status is, you know, it's up in the air. If they lose their habitat, these could be wiped off the planet forever. But they include one species of duck-billed platypus, which even has the, 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 the bill of a bird, uh, right? But they produce milk, uh, and they have hair, and they lay eggs. And they have a cloaca, so they only have one opening. And then there's another one, these echidnas. I always have trouble with that one. They look like little hedgehogs. There's two species there. And then you have the theria here. And here, instead of laying eggs, they're viviparous eggs. Uh, they're born uh, alive. And then you have two groups there. You have the marsupials and the placental mammals. And the marsupials, they're the pouched mammals. And there, their young are born very young, uh, very underdeveloped. Uh, they look like embryos uh, or not made of little fetuses that they come out and they crawl into the pouch and then they uh, uh, attach onto the nipple and continue to eat uh, or milk as they develop in there. For the placentals, that includes us, dolphins, bats, lions, their development goes further before birth. So looking at the monotremes, the egg layers here, they, they lay an egg. Uh, 
they have one common opening like a reptile or a bird uh, called the cloaca that was mentioned earlier and there the cloacas where the digestive urinary and the reproductive tracts all meet uh, in a little cavity and then the opening is called the cloaca now the bone structure is more reptile like when, when we look at the shoulder and the pelvis uh, the, the the structures and the way the limbs are attached are more like reptiles uh, and they don't have nipples. So they do have the glands that produce the milk, but the milk is just secreted uh, onto their fur and the infants lap it up or lick it up off the fur. Uh, and again, only three species, the, the duckbill platypus and the echidna is uh, two species of adults. Any other marsupials, these are the pouched mammals, um, and uh, they're the chorion and the amnion. Those are the membranes that you find in an amniotic egg. They develop. The embryos are going to be nourished by yolk, but there's no shell that forms around. It's almost like an egg that's retained in there. Uh, and this placenta is short-lived, so uh, the birth occurs very early in their development. So they're, they're naked, their eyes are closed. Uh, and in some cases, this can occur as little as eight days, depending on the species. So the young crawl out and, and uh, pull themselves along the hair of the female until they find their way into the pouch and then uh, latch onto the nipple and finish their development. Marsupials evolve shortly after, uh, I mean, shortly before eutherians. The eutherian, you means true placenta. The eutherians would be the placental mammals. So they evolve shortly before, about 125 million years ago. The greatest diversity is found in Australia and South America. Australia is famous for their kangaroos and koala bears and so on. Uh, and in North America, there's only one marsupial. It's not a rat. It's the possum or the tacuache that uh, uh, is what we commonly call them. And in the placental mammals, the, there, there's the, the true placenta that is produced. Uh, the embryo goes through uh, much more development. Uh, and um, the connection is very intimate between uh, the blood of the fetus and that of the of the female uh, that uh, or the the fetus is developing. Now uh, again, there's going to be considerably more development than for a uh, a marsupial. Uh, and most living mammals are going to be placental mammals. So here are so the orders, uh, just like you had bird orders and uh, there's amphibian orders. The class mammalia has several orders. You've probably heard of rodents. Well, the name of their order is Rodentia. I mentioned Chiroptera. Those are the bats. You've heard of carnivores there. That's the carnivora. And then this is our group. We belong to the order of primates or primates, which includes apes and monkeys and lemurs. Uh, and their general characteristics are over here, so primates have certain characteristics to tie us all together. If you have two, uh, if you have an even number of hooves, you're Artiodactyla, and then one of my favorite groups is these marine mammals, whales and dolphins. They belong to the Cetacea, and I'll never forget my, uh, one of my professors saying the word lagomorphs, referring to rabbits and jackrabbits or hares. And then uh, horses have odd number of toes, uh, perisodactyla. So this last section covers the order that we belong to called the order primates, or primates. And the uh, learning objectives or outcomes for this one is to describe the characteristics and major, uh, uh, and major groups of primates uh, what are their characteristics, and then there's the distinguishing uh, characteristics of hominids, which is a family of primates. Uh, the formal name is hominidae, uh, but hominid is like saying uh, mammalian mammals. Um, one's the formal name and the other one is just uh, informal, referring to them. Uh, and then your third learning outcome is to explain the variation, uh, the variations that form the basis for uh, uh, human races and why races do not uh, uh, represent uh, evolutionarily distinct entities. Uh, the point to the last one is that um, 
there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, there are not subspecies of humans, which would be what a race is for any other organism uh, that we study. So primates are the mammals that gave rise to our own species. So humans uh, did evolve from other animals as well. This is what the evidence uh, suggests, if that uh, line of thinking is, represents anything remotely close to the truth on how life on this planet uh, uh, arose and has evolved. Uh, so when we're looking at the primates, there's two features that allowed them to succeed uh, in an arboreal environment. So the ancestors of all primates were tree dwellers, arboreal. And one of them is grasping fingers and toes, the opposable thumbs that we have. That's from that ancestry. Uh, in many uh, other primates, they also have an opposable toe as well, and that helps them to grasp uh, things. And so this one feature allows us to manipulate things in the environment, to build tools and uh, technology. Now, uh, we also have binocular vision. And binocular vision is when you have two eyes facing in the front. That's typical of a lot of predators. Uh, but, uh, uh, and it's an adaptation to allow us to judge uh, distance and depth uh, more precisely. Uh, and so, um, that those are some features. And when you're in the trees, you got to be able to see uh, and judge the distance of limbs you're trying to use to move about. So, um, for the living primates, there is a group that looks exactly like what you see there in that image. I think it's a tarsier. Um, and uh, they're referred to as prosimians. Simians is a group that uh, the great apes belong to. Um, and so prosimians would be before. Uh, so this, these uh, primitive primates, you can tell this is nocturnal. When you look at these eyes, they're so huge and they can't even probably move them within those uh, sockets, the orbits. Uh, the group's now considered to be paraphyletic and uh, it includes the lemurs, lor lorises, and tarsiers like the one you see there. They do have large eyes and that allows for greater vision uh, for their nocturnal habits. But you can see that both the uh, fore and hind uh, or uh, hands and feet have the opposable uh, digit. Now, the primates, there's a subgroup uh, within the primates called the anthropoids. Uh, and that's for a suborder called the Anthropoidea. So there's a lot of taxonomy if you're going to study this uh, in more detail. Uh, but it's a suborder of it. So the anthropoids, anthros actually means man uh, in Greek. And so the anthropoids includes the monkeys, uh, which have tails, the apes, which do not have a tail, and the human ape, which also does not have a tail. And the anthropoids, one key characteristic is diurnal. And so one thing that evolved was if you're going to be active at night, you don't need to see color because you need white light to see color. Uh, so it's likely that the nocturnal primates don't have the tools for being able to see color, but color vision evolved uh, along with the diurnal habits that evolved within uh, that group of primates that includes the monkeys, apes, and humans. Brain getting larger as well uh, in this group, and um, um, they, there's a tendency for them to live in groups with complex social uh, structures within their uh, parents care for the young for an extended period of time. Uh, and this is uh, due to the fact that uh, brain requires uh, a lot more time to develop and for learning uh, so that uh, the individuals uh, can do better once they're on their own. Uh, so looking at the anthropoid or the anthropoidia history, we got to go back 30 million years. Uh, and uh, during this time, some migra uh, primates migrated into South America, uh, and uh, those are the New World monkeys. Um, all of them are arboreal. They have a prehensile tail. A prehensile tail is a tail that's uh, capable of grabbing uh, onto limbs. And then you have those that remained uh, in the Old World uh, uh, there in Africa. So these would be clear. These Old World monkeys and hominids remain there in Africa. So here you see a picture of a New World monkey 
um, they would be there in South America. This is the old world monkeys like this baboon and then the hominids, uh, which the humans and this gorilla here. There's a little confusion in the way the book, textbook, refers back and forth and even the notes they provided from the publisher, which I have to edit uh, quite a bit before using them here. Uh, so I try to make my own diagram to clarify some some of the terms to use them appropriately. Uh, and so looking at the hominoids, so if we look at the primates, the primates includes those prosimians uh, and the anthropoidea, which were the monkeys, uh, apes, and the humans. And then there's another group. So uh, kingdom phylum order, uh, kingdom phylum class order, uh, and then family, but we had a, uh, a suborder, uh, the anthropoidea. And then there's a the hominoidea. That's what these are, the hominoids is the formal name. And so the hominoids includes the apes and the hominids. It's not the hominidae, uh, the homin... This is where some of the problems started happening here. Uh, and it may depend on which uh, classification scheme they're using. But overall, this group is referring to both the apes and the hominids. And how do you know an ape? An ape is not going to have a tail. And they include gibbons. There's gibbons at uh, Gladys Porter Zoo uh, here in the valley. Orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. Larger brain size than monkeys. Uh, they lack tails. Uh, and it's a paraphyletic group, um, closely related to uh, this one here. And so you have the humans here, and um, it's, it's probably best if we went and we looked at this diagram here. And so uh, here you have the prosimians here, the lemurs, the lorises, and then the tarsiers there. And then here's your new world monkeys, your old world monkeys. And then uh, your apes here, the gibbons, orangutan, gorilla, and so on. And so here are the anthropoids. The anthropoids are from uh, the New World monkeys all the way over here to what's supposed to be the human group. And then they mentioned the hominoids, uh, and I drew a black bar. Uh, well, the hominoids is the pink one, and who's the gibbons, the orangutans, the gorillas. Now, these guys right here are the Asian uh, group, and then these are the African group here. Uh, and so we start dividing further. There's family, there's subfamily, there's even uh, below family tribe before you get to genus. And so the terms get all mixed up. But what, what's important here is that we understand that right here at this point, the chimpanzee is more closely related to the group that's supposed to include the humans. And they belong to a tribe called the Hominini. And so we refer to them as the hominins. A tribe is a, is a formal group below family, but above genus. Uh, and the, the DNA in chimpanzees and the molecular is much more closely closer to human group than it is to gorillas and orangutans. So that was that's surprising given on the appearance of these of these primates. Uh, overall, so uh, you got to go back all the way back here to find the uh, ancestor of all the primates. Got to go back to 60 about 60 65 million years, and we find the common ancestor to uh, chimps and humans here were under 10 million years, maybe five six million years ago. And there is actually a difference. This one is from the older lab manual, and then this one's from the newer one here. Uh, when we look here, um, here they have the hominids on this one, and another one from the older book. They refer to the hominoids, which is a rank a little bit higher that includes the gibbons. So here they have a rank lower, and it excludes the gibbons. Uh, so anyway, um, looking at the apes versus the hominids, and this is where I have problems with it because the apes are actually within some of these groups they're trying to separate. Uh, if they're trying to refer to the hominids as the group that belongs to humans, uh, then it's hominin. 
not a hominid, but uh, anyhow, um, the if we take the hominids for the author of this of uh, the book to mean the human group, then what they're doing is they're comparing the group of humans, maybe the chimpanzees as well, to the other great apes. Uh, and so, what is the big difference? Well, what separates the human group from all the other primates? Well, walking upright, bipedalism. Uh, the ape group uh, didn't go bipedal. They still use their uh, their limb, their four limb, upper limbs, to walk on their knuckles. You may have seen, you may have seen a gorilla running uh, or sprinting down. Uh, down a path on, the, on TV or at the zoo or wherever. Uh, so the, the differences are related to the bipedal locomotion. If we look at the structure of the, of the human group to walk bipedal, there's some big differences structurally. Um, the hip bone is more like a bowl to support the organs above uh, that are there in the abdominal cavity. The, the opening from the skull where the spinal cord exits is more under the skull because we walk upright, whereas the apes is more uh, toward the back of the skull since they walk on their on their knuckles there. Uh, and the femurs, the thigh bones, are more uh, inward under the weight of the human. So there's a lot of features that you can use when you see a fossil and it's not Homo sapiens, it's not us, but you look at it and you start to analyze, you say, this is a bipedal primate, you can tell, uh, based on those feet, uh, comparative anatomy. Uh, so looking at the early hominids, in this case, the other taking it to mean the, the line that uh, involves the human ancestry, uh, ancestry to our group. So we're looking at several genera, but one main one is Homo. That's the one we belong to. We're Homo sapiens. That includes three to seven species. And then there's the genus Australopithecus which is about seven species. This is an older group that is smaller, has a smaller brain. And there's several other uh, groups that are, have been found in the fossil record as well. But one thing that is certain is that within this group, the characteristic, that hallmark for this group is bipedalism, marking bipedal. So here is a timeline on the bottom in the millions of years ago and these bars represent the, the ages of the fossils that have been found. And so we mentioned Homo australopithecus. We can see the australopithecus, uh, different uh, species here, Rhamnus, Anamensis, uh, Afarensis, Africanus, uh, Boisei, and Robustus over here, uh, taking us near where Homo sapiens first appears. Solanthropus. Uh, and then here are some of the skulls uh, of some of these. These are Arthropus, Australopithecus, uh, Robustus, Afarensis. Here's Homo habilis, a closer relative to us, Florensis. And then that's the human uh, skull. And you can see, look at the brain case. Much, much larger brain case there for a, a species whose scientific name means thinks. Homo sapiens, sapiens means to think or be to be wise uh, overall. So... Uh, when we look at what would be the uh, closest uh, relative that Homo may may be most closely related to, uh, I think it's uh, Australopithecus africanus. Um, let's see what the, the, the notes are. Now that we know uh, Australopithecus, we refer to that group where the, the shared ancestry with Homo, Homo would be the Australopithecines uh, group. Uh, so you can look at other phylogenies that identify this group, and then you see Australopithecus, and then you see Homo genus uh, diverging from that group with a common ancestor. But some of the early Australopithecus, uh, they were not very uh, tall at all. When we look at the skeletons, 18 kilograms, that's going to be like 40 pounds or so, a meter tall, uh, which is just over three feet. Um, they're going to have... Uh, teeth that were more human-like uh, overall, but the brains were not much bigger than that of apes, and they did walk upright based on those skeletal features we discussed. So looking at bipedalism, there's debate in the scientific community, and then 
you propose the hypothesis and then you see where the evidence takes you. This is observational. You've got to wait till we uncover fossils and then try to build that puzzle and see what goes on. So the debate was whether or not uh, bipedalism came first or the expansion of the brain getting bigger. Uh, and some more recent fossils have kind of uh, uh, favored one hypothesis over the other. Uh, so the fossils suggest that bipedalism evolved first in, in about 4 million years ago. Uh, and then uh, the expansion of the brain getting much larger uh, began to occur more significantly about 2 million years ago. Um, so why bipedalism even occurred is a matter of some debate. Uh, some, there's some interesting hypotheses out there moving down from the trees. And as climate was changing, uh, when you have less rain, it's drier, you're going to have less tree life, so there's not many trees to climb on, so now you're walking on the ground in tall grass. Walking upright might be an advantage for that. That's one of the hypotheses there. So looking at the genus Homo, the first humans evolved from the Australopithecine group maybe about 2 million years ago, uh, and the uh, most close, closest ancestors thought to be uh, the Australopithecus uh, afarensis. I said I thought it was Africanus, but uh, going back over here, um, and there's the the two bars there. So afarensis is this one right here. Okay. Um, and where are we? So uh, in the 1960s. Uh, some fossils were found uh, of early Homo, and they uh, gave it the name Habilis, which means handyman, Homo habilis. And the reason they did that was because they found tools with some of these fossils, tools that had to have been fashioned by this species here. The brain was not large, relatively speaking. Uh, they give the volumes here in cubic centimeters, which is equivalent to um, um, a milliliter a volume of in milliliters. So if we compared Homo habilis to Australopithecus, Homo habilis 680 cubic centimeters, whereas Australopithecus for 400 at 550. So we do see a, a brain getting larger here for the genus Homo. And then Homo erectus, uh, another fossil uh, spe and named species. Sometimes they include another Homo called Ergaster with this one to make a single species. Uh, whatever the case is, this um, this species uh, now is, th these are extinct uh, is one that they've uh, know the most about. They've got many many fossils of these, uh, uh, and the fossils have been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe, uh, telling that this species uh, migrated quite a bit from wherever its origin was. Uh, and so uh, 1.5 meters tall, a much larger brain now, we're at 1,000 cubic centimeters. And the evidence suggests, based on um, they have these anthropology studies, uh, um, that they lived in tribes, maybe 20 to 50 individuals, often uh, spending some time in caves. Here was a recent find in 2004. Um, they nicknamed this one the Hobbit after the hobbits from the Lord of the Rings uh, because of the small stature of the fossils, uh, pretty small. Uh, 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 Human-like uh, species. Uh, they called it Homo floresiensis because they, they named it after the island where it was found. Originally, it was thought that the fossils dated to 15,000 years, but like science always does, you test and you retest, and now the newer estimates are 60 to 100,000 years ago for those fossils. One of the features that was where it gets its nickname, the Hobbit, is its small stature. Uh, and they coexisted with actually miniature species of elephants as well, and it seems to follow a trend that when you have these uh, mammals, endotherms that go on to these islands, there's a tendency for them to become dwarfed overall. So there was an actual dwarf, dwarfed uh, species of elephant uh, on the island as well, and it uh, was suggested that, that perhaps this species of, of homo uh, hunted them, probably to perhaps to extinction. 
And so here's a normal modern human height there on the image uh, right here. And a uh, you know, big elephant uh, from Africa or Asia. And uh, this is uh, Homo floresiensis, and this is the dwarf uh, elephant that's now extinct from uh, fossils from that island. Called island dwarfism is the phenomenon. Uh, now, there is a more recently described uh, species. I'm only barely learning about this one here. And so uh, right now named Homo naledi. And um, this one has a mix of features. Uh, some typical Homo, uh, like the shape of the feet and the teeth, uh, but a small brain. Uh, some some of the features are like the Australopithecines with the curved fingers uh, and the shape of the legs for climbing. Um, doesn't fit the progression that we would expect for a very simple evolution. And this is the thing is that these fossils are uncovering a very complex uh, past for uh, the group that eventually led to us the only living species of Homo today. Uh, so for modern humans. The modern, modern Homo uh, species, uh, sometimes they're referred to as three different species, sometimes uh, as one species combined. If you combine them as one species, then modern humans evolved perhaps 60, 600,000 years ago. Otherwise, if you separate them, you only go back maybe 100 to 200,000 years old, uh, ago where you find evidence of the first Homo sapiens. Uh, so there's Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, which uh, the Neanderthals, uh, and then Sapiens, the man who thinks. So here, uh, just a comparison between the Neanderthalus and Cro-Magnons, which would be Homo sapiens, the modern ones. Uh, Cro-Magnon gets the name from where the first, uh, the oldest fossils have been found. I think it's some riverbed somewhere. For Homo neanderthalus, they were they did produce a diverse array of tools. Uh, they buried their uh, they took care of their sick, buried their dead. Uh, all of these were symbolic ways of symbolic thinking, uh, perhaps uh, primitive religion uh, for them. Uh, and they disappeared about thirty four thousand years ago. So they occur at the same time that Homo sapiens occurs. So. Uh, when we look at Cro-Magnons, which would be Homo sapiens, uh, and uh, there was potential for meeting up with the Andrusalensis, and so there's not a lot of evidence for regular interbreeding, but there was some uh, interbreeding, uh, and DNA, and DNA analysis has, has confirmed that in some populations of, of humans today. Um, for uh, the Cro-Magnons, which is uh, Homo sapiens, more complex social organization, elaborate cave paintings, uh, and probably full language capabilities for them. Here's a picture of some cave uh, art from uh, Cro-Magnons. Now Homo, sap uh, Homo sapiens, uh, today we're the only surviving Homo, all the other Homo species have gone extinct. Uh, we see much bigger brain size here. Very effective tool making technologies. Uh, very uh, refined, abstract, and conceptual thinking, symbolic language, cultures. Uh, not to say that the other groups didn't have their culture and culture. A simple definition is when you pass your knowledge on uh, to the next group, uh, things you've learned, things you know, things you value. Uh, and so uh, today's humans now are um, able to mold the world in a way that benefits them because of the technologies that we've been able to create and so on. So for the first time, you have a, a species on this planet that may not be restricted to uh, how the environment can restrict. Um, in some ways, that's good. That's why I'm here because it's likely that some of my ancestors benefited from technologies like ag agriculture was the agricultural revolution, grow food, medicine, and all of that stuff. Um, how good or bad that be remains to be seen as uh, the planet is going through significant changes with 7 billion people trying to mold the, in ways that uh, can continue to support these large numbers. 
Uh, now, when it comes to race, as I mentioned earlier, that um, while we are very visual in the way we see things, and noticing differences among populations has, has uh, promoted us to be thinking about the human species as occurring as races, which would be the equivalent of subspecies. Uh, and skin color, for example, the, the problem here is that in order for subspecies to evolve, which would eventually give it enough time for new species, is that those populations need to be isolated, and the human population is worldwide, and so genes, genes are constantly flowing. That means individuals from different parts of the world are interbreeding still, so there is still this mixing of genes. And so overall, there's there's no potential to form subspecies over given enough time. And this is highlighted if you were to analyze uh, genetic makeup of populations and try to correlate it to skin color, you see the two maps side by side and there's no correlation there. So when you look at genetic similarity, it seems that people from Europe, which typically have lighter skin, are more similar genetically in any genes that count when it comes to these types of characteristics uh, to uh, uh, populations in Africa um, genetically. And then when you compare the skin color, see those same individuals are very light complexed in Europe and much darker skin tones in Africa. So there's no correlation there. So here's some evidence against uh, any kind of uh, subspecies or races among humans.